Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Let's Give It a Voice here at the Voice of Hope Media with myself, Clarice Angafor. It's a, a new day. It's a Saturday, Saturday, the 7th of November. And, uh, well, there seems to be some good news coming over from the U.S. And <laughs> the White House seems to, to have been formally forbidden from <laughs> from Trump's entry. So it is for Biden now. So you're welcome to our show today. I'm Clarice Angafor, or you can call me AC. This is the Voice of Hope Media. Here at the Voice of Hope Media, we educate, we empower, we inspire, and we give hope to those who are facing challenging or complex life issues, including special educational needs. This is a platform where we encourage individuals to share their experiences, to share their stories, knowing that it's a safe space for them to, to say whatever they want to say or whatever experiences they faced in the past, but they have to know that they will be heard, that there is a community here who will hear them and won't judge them or stigmatize them for whatever they've been through. So we go through a series of different topics every week, topics which most often people regard as too emotional, people regard as taboo topics. People don't want to talk about these topics because of experiences they've lived in the past or because they still have the sad memories about these particular things they faced in the past. But here at The Voice of Hope Media, we encourage you, we open up conversations around these topics with the aim of educating, empowering, inspiring, giving hope, and raising awareness on all these issues. So today, the 7th of November, we are going to give a voice to a very important topic. Yes, it's a topic which I hold very dear and very close to my heart, and it's autism. So it's all about autism awareness today. And unfortunately, when most people hear of autism, what they think of is children. So many people seem to think that autism is a child is a childhood disability or a childhood condition, but it's worth noting that a child with autism is going to grow into an adult with autism. And for our guest speakers today, we have William. <laughs> William, you are going to pronounce the name later. We have William and we have Marcus. William is here in the UK and Marcus is all the way from the US, all the way from Arizona. Yes. So I'm so excited. If you are watching, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for inviting your friends and thank you for sharing because today, actually, we are going to learn we are going to unlearn, we are going to debunk most of those myths that people know about autism and adulthood and even children. Yes, like I said, our guest speakers are two special young gentlemen, Marcus and William. So we are going to start and we get them to introduce themselves and then I am going to do more introduction in, for, on the show before we actually go into the questions we have for our guests today. So if you are watching, please share and invite your friends to watch as well. If you have any questions, put them down here for our guest speakers to be able to answer. They may answer them now or they may be able to answer them after the show, but rest assured that all your questions will be taken care of. And thank you once more for joining in. Hi, everyone. Hi, William. Hi, Marcus. My, Marcus, hello. I'm so hello. I'm so sorry about the the time, but I'm really grateful that you've you you've come on now instead of two of noon as we we initially talked about. So I really appreciate that so much. So you you all are here. It's the voice of Hope Media, and the edition is Let's Give It a Voice. So today we are giving a voice to autism in the black community. We are giving a voice to what it is being Black and being autistic in the Black community. Yes, it's not as easy as it sounds. There are challenges as well as there are good, very good moments. 
but we are going to hear from them. We are going to hear from Marcus. We are going to hear from, from William. And William is in the UK, Marcus is in the US. So at some point, there will be differences in their experiences. So we hear from them. I will start with you, Marcus, for your introduction. Just tell us about a brief introduction about yourself, who you are. I am Marcus Boyd. I'm an autism activist. I am um, a 13-time music award-winning music producer and composer. Um, I won four autism activist awards. Um, I've been mm -hmm. being an autism activist for almost three years. Yeah. I was born with autism. I didn't start speaking until like 13, 13 and a half um, at a two-year-old's level. Um, the doctor said that my left side of my brain doesn't function correctly. So I will always need a caregiver to feed, clothe, bathe me. Um, you know, if I get any education, it will be little uh, based off the brain functionality. Um, but, you know, I have a bachelor's degree in uh, journalism and mass communications from Asheville University Online. And I'm presently trying to go back to school right now for audio engineering. So <laughs> um, I just think that, um, yeah, this is a little bit about me. So we can go to Mr. Okay. Will. Thank you so much, Marcus. And guys, if you're watching, it's going to be interesting. Sometimes doctors say things based on their statistics, but I always say they are not God. So William, over to you. Hi, I'm William. Um, I'm an autistic adult, black male. Um, I'm also an early years teacher and an autistic advocate. Um, that means um, I do help families um, who are going through um, the system, trying to get a diagnosis. I am part of an organization called AIM. I'm a director. AIM stands for Autistic Inclusive Meets. And what we do is that we um, organize activities for autistic um, people and their families, autistic children, autistic adults. We also um, embark on campaigns against um, quack treatments and try to promote autism acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, so that's me. Um, I've also um, got a bachelor's degree in French and politics. I've um, recently obtained a master's degree in um, early childhood studies. And I'm on my way to um, apply for a PhD right now in early childhood studies as well. Thank you so much. That's brilliant. Well done, guys. And this exactly, this gives me a lot of hope. Me, because I'm also, I'm a parent of an autistic child. He's not yet an adult, but he's 15 now. And this gives me hope. Just hearing from Marcus um, saying, you, you said you started speaking at the age of 13 and a half. Yes. About 13, 13 and a half. Yes, ma'am. That's good. So I still have hope. I've never given up hope. Yeah, my son is, he's, he's 15 now. And he, he's, he still hasn't got words. I always say he hasn't got words yet. But if he can mime, if he can type and he can do other things and he understands the spoken word. So I know that there will be that the spoken word will come someday. And this also applies to any parent watching right now. Just know that all is not lost. Marcus and William just them being on our show today is a lot of hope that they are going to that they are giving us today and just if you've listened to their introduction what they've already achieved so far and they are still going to achieve quite a lot especially academic wise where most often we are told that our children are not capable of learning our children are not capable of doing anything but they are they are capable of doing quite quite a lot we have the proof right here in front of us. So share, guys, share. So before we, we actually start, I, I am there's something which I need to call our attention to. If you discovered, you are watching, you discovered on the on the poster, you, you have two symbols. You have the, the, the ribbon, which has the puzzle signs, and you have the infinity, the infinity sign. Okay, I am going to give um, a little explanation ab about these two these two symbols. We all know that um, once you've met one autistic individual, you've met just that one autistic individual, and so there are all there are differences. Each of them develop differently, and they understand things differently, and they learn differently. 
as well. I know sometimes people say, oh, I've met one. I've met, I know about autism because I, uh, I've met an autistic person because I, I dealt with this person. So I know everything. It's, it's not always like that because what you know about one individual who is autistic is, may not be exactly how you will be able to you will be able to handle the other person. So I had um, some notes from, from William, which you'll permit me read before we continue. We are going to, uh, uh, William had a write-up about the infinity symbol, symbol, which is what uh, William believes so much in. And I've gone through Marcus's um, profile. I know you, you, you love the puzzle signs. You you promote the puzzle signs because most of your 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 activities they have the puzzle sign on it. I myself I do because this is our this is our charity and that's the that's the logo. It's got the puzzle sign. For some reason I fell in love with the colors and the reason behind the 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 colors and the and the brightness and then the puzzles itself. But I would like to read out to you guys what William sent to me about the infinity sign. It's good that we all respect uh, each other's beliefs or, or what they think about themselves. We have to give them that respect. And that's why I had to put the two symbols on our flyer because I cannot impose what I believe in on another person. So. Here is the infinity symbol. So William says, um, autism has often been symbolized by a puzzle piece, which was first used by the National Autistic Society in 1963 and later adopted by organizations such as Autism Speaks, which has a less than positive reputation within the autism community. The puzzle piece raised a number of questions about its helpfulness in accepting autism as a neurotype infantilization of autism a puzzle being a child a child's toy implies that autism is a childhood condition hence the number of materials and support out there that is geared towards children with very little about autism in adulthood the solving of autism one could also infer from the puzzle piece that autism is a problem that has to be solved similarly a single puzzle peace in isolation could mean that the rest are missing. That is, the individual is not whole as long as they are autistic. It also implies the need to fit in rather than being ourselves. So William says, in recent times, things have changed. Our language about disability has changed changed as well. Autistic rights advocates have therefore adopted the infinity symbol as most appropriate to symbolize the autistic spectrum and neural diversity because it embodies the endless possibilities we have as a united autistic community. The symbol is a loop, meaning there is begin there's no beginning and no end. This means inclusion and integration of autistic individuals in the community. So he says he would stress here that integration is the key word, not assimilation. With integration, autistic people become a whole with society by bringing in our input. Assimilation, on the other hand, suggests that we leave behind who we are and mimic the behaviors of our neurotypical peers an ideology pushed forward by applied behavioral analysis, analysis scientists. Secondly, um, William says the infinity symbol is a material symbol. It's a mat mathematical symbol. Many autistics have an affinity for maths, hence it being a more mature option to the puzzle toy. So that's what um, William and so many others out there um, think believe uh, autism is supposed to stand for. Then they believe, and they've given really concrete reasons of why the infinity sign should be used. And so we go on to talk a little bit about the about the puzzle sign, which I got from the from the website, from the National Autistic website and other information on online as well. And I'm going to read that out as well. So this is the puzzle symbol, which if you've 
uh, if if any of you watching, if you've be, been talking about autism for a long time, you obviously know that this is the sign that most often comes up when we talk about autism. So national, nas the, the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Here, I'm going to define autism first before I talk about the, the puzzle. So the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, the autism um, refers to autism as the autistic spectrum disorder. And it says it is a group of complex neuro neurodevelopmental disorders characterized by repetitive and char characteristic patterns of behavior and difficulties with social communication and integration. So I'm just going to leave it here for the def definition of autism because here we have two adults who are very much aware of what autism is. So we are not going to define autism because they are going to tell us what autism is from their own perspective. So the autism puzzle piece, however, has stirred some controversy. Depending how its meaning is interpreted, the logo has drawn positive and negative reactions over the years. Those who support the the use of the puzzle piece as a symbol of autism believe that it accurately represents the puzzling nature of the condition and how even today when we have a better understanding of autism than we did in the 60s there is still much more to know so for others the puzzle piece symbolizes everyone coming together to support those living with autism with it's different colors and combinations for some. It better represents the diversity of people living on the autism spectrum. Then on the flip side, there are those who find the puzzle piece insulting. So the puzzle piece is so effective because it tells us something about autism. It tells us that our children are handicapped by a puzzling condition. This isolates them from normal human contact and therefore they do not fit in. If in the future we can invest in our society even more thought, effort and commitment, our puzzle piece will become a symbol of hope for autistic people and their families. So what I will say here is rather than arguing over things such as logos, I think um, personally, I do think that our concentration should be more on autism awareness, autism acceptance, inclusion, and, and every other thing, because that's all, that's all that really, really matters to, to everyone, everyone being able to accept, understand, love, and include anyone out there who is autistic because no none of them did ask to be born that way so thank you so much once more for watching and we are going to go over to our questions and we've already william has already talked about himself and marcus has talked uh, uh, briefly about himself himself so how does it affect you being autistic on a day-to-day -day basis william i'll start with you Okay, first of all, I would like to establish the fact that um, uh, it's challenging to be um, autistic. I'll explain in a few minutes. But however, if I'm being given the chance again to come back to this world, I'll still choose to be autistic because I, I've come to love the way I am. I've come to respect the way I am and um, I enjoy being um, autistic. Yeah. Um, yes, it's quite a an enjoyable, colorful experience, the way I experience the world. Now, how does it affect me on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, um, it's often said that autism is more of a social disability, and we live in a social world where um, everyone is social, we speak to each other, and we ask questions, we, um, we speak in um, different conventions and um, subtleties, most of which I do not have. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult for me to fit in and to blend in, let's say at work, or maybe when you are on public transport and the person next to you wants to chat to me about something that I have absolutely no interest in. It's quite awkward for me. Um, also, um, I've got this condition called uh, face blindness. Uh, face blindness is um, when everybody 
almost looks the same. It's hard for me to register people's um, facial expressions, Espe not, not just facial expressions, but even facial features. So for example, if I were to meet you somewhere um, in the middle of town, um, it will take a while for me to recognize that yes, I'm speaking to Clarice. Because okay. first of all, I'm meeting him in a deep line, not on Facebook, I maybe just at Trafalgar Square. So um, first of all, you don't fit that context. Yeah, because <laughs> at Trafalgar Square, I'm afraid to see just random people, not someone I know. Um, so you might have to describe yourself and give me more clues as to who you are. Most people don't do that. They'll just start speaking to me. And I'll spend most of the time not listening to them, but actually trying to work out where on earth did I see this face? Yeah. Um, I've also got um, issues with my left and right. That's um, due to um, a, what's it called? Um, I can't remember the exact term. I, I put myself on the spot, but it's just about um, knowing your um, yourself in space, finding yourself in space. Yeah. So, um, for example, if someone is trying to give me directions, mm -hmm. they will say, go left, go right. I have to recite this mantra in my head. I write mm -hmm. with my right, what's left is my left, before I'm able to know what um, they're talking about. Um, that's another thing. Um, I'm quite um, triggered by smells, as well as strong smells. So let's say if someone puts um, um, too much um, perfume, I might... Um, I, I might not get a total meltdown, but um, it will be quite noticeable to the extent that I'll fi find it quite difficult to um, to focus on anything. Mm -hmm. And also everything around me um, adds up. I'm quite um, prone to depression and anxiety. So um, it's like whenever I wake up in the morning, my life, my page is a blank sheet and everything that happens um, smell something on my page. So by the end of the day, you might find that I'll just slump in bed and just, um, you think I'm a lazy person, but no, everything that has happened in the day has left an imprint on that page. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so it's um, worn me out. Also, um, I experienced what we call um, social exhaustion. Um, there's a part of the brain that's responsible for um, social um interaction is quite relaxing and another part of the brain that's used for working such as solving a math problem now that part of my brain that's supposed to process social interaction and um, doesn't function that well mm -hmm. so i rely on my mathematical and working part of the brain to process social um situations yeah. so it gets me really really tired so when people like after work, they decide to go to the pub and have a nice time relaxing and um, chatting. I can't really do that. I'll be even more tired because like unpaid overtime for me. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. So many people don't understand that. Um, so I'll just um, stop right now because if I, um, I know I can go on and on and on about how autism affects me on a day-to-day -day basis. It's quite a lot. Okay. So this is an example here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Over to you, um, Marcus. How, how, how does autism affect you on a day-to-day -day basis as an adult? Um, it's really, it's, you know, it's a it's a day-by-day -day pill type of situation because mm -hmm. you can have your ups, you can have your downs, you can, you can be in the middle. Um, you know, I deal with some of the same issues, anxiety, depression. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't, I have, I don't bother people. So because I like my space and, you know, I don't have a big circle of people because it's hard for me to, um, you know, really interact like I want to with a lot of people yeah. uh, based off my um, my autism. So it's like I hide behind a lot of stuff. Certain sounds mess with me, certain colors mess with me, certain tastes mess with me, certain foods and stuff of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even though I'm almost 40. You know, it's it's a everyday type of situation. And I will say this, that, you know, I chose the puzzle piece because it represents me as an individual, as an individual who owns a clothing line called the A Collection. Me and my partners, we took the inclusion um, to, uh, to heart because we don't want to disrespect or offend anybody's views, beliefs, or how they feel. So we changed our whole logos. We did everything to, to make sure that 
everybody can be in a comfortable position as far as his clothing line is concerned. Yeah. And second of all, um, you know, it's just, it's just, for me, it's an up and down situation because I am a sociable person. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes it's hard to be social with people, even if you know them. And it's definitely harder for people that you don't know. And, you know, um, I use headphones. That's my mechanism. I use mm-hmm. headphones and music. So that's my calm space. That's my peace point. Yeah. So everybody has their own personal peace point on their own personal calm space. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's for me, it's just an up and down type of situation. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's brilliant. Thank you, guys. Um, William, let me come back to you. The word you were thinking of, is it enterocep- interoception? Hold on. So, it wasn't exactly interoception. It was another word. Um, okay. Is it proprioception? It should yeah, be. Yeah, I think it, it was proprioception instead. Proprioception, yeah. Funny yeah. enough, I was reading about interoception the other day. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So, can, can, can you explain more on 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 that either either of, in in any of them? Um, okay, with proprioception, um, when I was little, I used to bump into things a lot, mm-hmm. and I used to be told off about it. Later on, that I realized that it was part of my condition. It's yeah. um, about a lack of it's about a lack of awareness of um, your body within the environment. Yeah. So, for example, I don't really know how big I am until I see myself on video or in pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. um, I work with children, and mm-hmm. sometimes I just um, lie on the floor with them, um, reading books together and patterns. But when I look at pictures of um, me in my practice, I'm like, wow, I am long. I'm occupying the whole floor. Why? Because um, to me, I'm just like that. I'm just like them, okay, as small as them. Um, so when, when you are not aware of your um, how much space you occupy, how much um, of your body takes in space, it um, sort of affects uh, the way you navigate in in life. Okay, okay. it affects okay. Um, your sense of direction. For example, whenever I enter a shop and I come out, I find myself going back to the direction where I came from rather than going to the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. I don't know yeah. if I'm making myself clear. Yeah. And I've had, yeah, I've had to rely on Google Maps a lot um, for uh, to go to places I've been a hundred times just because of this lack of awareness of space and direction. So mm-hmm. it's something like um, um, there's a defect with my internal GPS, to put it that way, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you so much for that additional information. And then to to our next question, you know, one of the one of the things that I I, I hear most often as a parent of an autistic child is when you tell someone, my child is is autistic or my child has a form of disability. The first thing that you hear is, oh, but they look normal. But he looks normal. But he she, she looks normal. There's this thing that um, people seem to think that because you, you you look normal, you cannot have a disability. So how, how can you uh, help others, um, help others understand that you look normal, but you, but you do struggle because of autism? Marcus? Um, you know, for, for me, it was always, um, yeah, he looks normal and Mm -hmm. stuff of that nature but see you know for a long time my grandma and them really didn't believe in it because you're talking about 93 so in 93 there was no books pamphlets there was nothing of like they were just giving out for autism it wasn't doing that and at that time frame so in the same token my grandma just thought i needed some holy oil and jesus and stuff (laughs) like that and then you know i'm gonna be okay Mm -hmm. because anything jesus can he can heal you from, or he can, you know, take away out of your life. But, you know, uh, autism doesn't have a certain look down syndrome, cerebral palsy, those type of, um, you know, situations have more of a look autism has more of the action. It's more of a action type of situation because I can be sitting right next to you. I want to know William had autism based off his look. 
You understand mm-hmm. what I'm saying? But I would know William have autism based off his conversation. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah. it's a it's a universal thing. It's a universal thing with autism. You can hear it through the vocals. You may not be able to see it from your facial. Mm-hmm. And and even if you see it from your facial, that don't mean there's anything wrong with it. See, what we have to stop doing is entitling ourselves or putting ourselves in a title to where it's like, okay, you have autism. So, okay, people have cancer or people have lupus or mm-hmm. whatever, but there are still people thriving with cancer. There's still people thriving with lupus and it's millions of people thriving with autism. Yeah. Mm. That's brilliant. I love the way you've, you've put it. Yes. I usually, I, I usually like to say that um, autism, you will not, look just look at an autistic individual and you say he or she is autistic until you start communicating until you start interacting with the person then you can start suspecting that maybe there is something wrong or that there's something different with that person but until you talk to that person particular individual and ask him or her questions or you talk to the to the individual's parent or caregiver caregiver you may not be able to know the correct answer so over to you william how do you make others how do you let others know that even though you look normal you can still struggle sometimes because of uh, uh, autism and um, it's been quite difficult to let people understand this because especially in the black communities our idea of um, disability is um wheelchair it's a wheelchair yeah exactly yeah Mm -hmm. so if you are not in a wheelchair you are not disabled you are not struggled i myself i didn't know i was autistic until um in my late 30s i was never diagnosed no one mentioned the word autism when i was growing up because um i'm now in my 40s and um born in the 70s there was not much out there much awareness about autism. I grew up in different parts of the world. I grew up in Ghana, I grew up in France, and um, in those places, even right now in France, people look at autism from a, me- a medical point of view rather than a social, with the social model of disability, which means they see it as a disease. And back in Ghana, um, we've still got, we've got people who are trying to um, promote um, autism awareness, um, like um, people like um, Miss Sewa Kweno, uh, yeah, Mami yeah, Sewa, yeah, you know her, yeah, and um, other people um, who are just trying to bring um, autism um, to the forefront, but it's still um, slow because of the mindset of the people. Mm-hmm. They still believe that um, disability is someone being in a wheelchair. In the UK as well, we do have um, that sort of mindset. So um, I think the supermarkets have begin, began to um, give a symbol. I think it's a green um, lanyard with some um, sunflowers on it to show that yeah. um, even though I don't look disabled, I, I have a disability, so I might need help. Um, I just speak to people during my campaigns about um, what it takes to um, have an invisible um, condition. At my workplace, I talk to people. Um, I do a lot of campaigning on the internet as well. Mm-hmm. And because um, it's quite challenging, to, especially when you find yourself in a situation where you have to use a facility designed yeah. for uh, disabled people. And people see you entering and they say you are an able-bodied person and you and leave this facility for a disabled per- people. It's quite, it can quite be um, offensive. So um, it's a work in progress, but we are getting there mm-hmm. to raise right. the awareness. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And like you, you rightly said, it's a work in progress. And looking back, just from my own perspective, looking back uh, four or five years ago, autism awareness, acceptance, there's been a massive difference, even with uh, people around in the communities. There, there's there's a difference in, in how they approach autistic individuals or even in how they care for autistic individuals or even the names that they use, that they used to use in those days to label autistic individuals. There's a massive change. People are now understanding it more. People are now accepting 
autistic individuals more, including their families, and they and individuals are more accommodating and includes and including more of autistic individuals and families in the community. But in the next ten years, we want to see more of this happening. We more we want to see more inclusion. We want to see more acceptance and love as well as understanding. And so, yeah. Um, what are some of the challenges you faced so far? We, you are here in, in the UK and we know the majority of the population is a white population. So what are some of the challenges you faced over the years being a black or autistic adult in your community? Do you only face difficulties from, do challenges come from your, your, the, from your, your black peers or from the white? peers or the or general? Um, I would say um, there's a blend of both. Many of the challenges I faced over the years stem from the black community due to the mm. stigma, the inequalities yeah. and the lack of um, awareness. And um, mm. I've got um, well-meaning friends who have tried to silence me from uh, my autism awareness campaign because it's mm. so embarrassing. I come from um, quite a well-to-do family. We've got a very um, big family name. And mm -hmm. um, I'm associated with people, friends, and people who are also quite um, high up in society. So for me to come up and say I've got this condition, which also comes with this mental um, illness, and I'm always posting things about depression and anxiety and suicide awareness, it's, it doesn't sit well among yeah. many people. Also, I come from a, a, a very strong Christian background. Um, and for um, to looking at black Christianity, um, as Marcus was saying, um, there's a lot of Jesus will take it away, um, Jesus will heal it. You are this way because you don't pray enough, you don't fast enough, and you can't be a Christian and be suffering from this condition. I've got a lot of this. Um, I find it very hard to um, make friends, to make conversation, and I've been told many times on the pulpit and off pulpit that um, he who um, lacks friends, he who wants friends must show himself friendly. If you can't talk to people, you can't be a Christian. I've been bombarded with things like that before all coming from the um, black um, community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but um, to be fair, I've also got um, some support from um, black people in the community. I've spoken to people and they've looked back and they've seen that they themselves are having traits of autism. So, yeah. yeah so they've. Um, my campaign has not just fallen on rocks, but it's also um, brought us a step closer to acceptance. Now, the word acceptance in autism didn't really sit well among uh, many of the people close to me, um, okay. because I'm supposed to refuse and rebuke it. However, um, what I had to make them understand is that autism is part of me. It's like my identity. You cannot have William without having autism, without having autism with it because autism is part of who i am it's in my brain if you want to take autism away from me you have to kill me take my brain and transplant someone else's brain in me and i'll be a totally different person by then mm -hmm. that is part of who i am yeah. um, it's one thing to promote autism awareness it's another thing to promote acceptance and um, i'm sure rosa parks was um, told many times why she should just um keep standing and not sitting in the bus and accept the fact that um, she's going to be marginalized. But she stood on her ground and said, no, you know what? I'm going to put myself out in front of it. Even if I have to go to jail for that, I'll do that. Just so that the generations after will be free to be themselves. And mm -hmm. that's the situation where um, we autistic advocates are right now. We are saying that, you know what? It must be embarrassing to come out and say, yes, I'm autistic and blah, blah. But you know what? We are getting closer step by step to this kind of freedom to be ourselves. And mm -hmm. out of that, autistic people who are coming back in next generations are going to enjoy the freedom that we rightfully fought for. Now, on the white side, I will say that um, 
I do experience some sort of um, discrimination here and there. But yes. um, yeah, for example, a few years ago, I registered for a teaching course mm -hmm. and um, I spent all my money. Um, I and my wife, we put our resources together. We're not entitled to student finance or anything because by then I wasn't a British citizen. I spent mm -hmm. all my resources, everything. I got yes. no support because um, Apparently, because I wasn't diagnosed, I didn't even know that I was autistic, but I was working in an educational environment yeah. where they have um, access to um, autistic people. They knew all the networks, the same coordinated and everything, yet none of them could pinpoint to the fact that my behavior was um, symbolic of autism. Okay. Yeah, right now, looking back in retrospect, I believe that they saw through it, but because... Um, of many things, maybe including my color, they decided to sweep it under the carpet. Long story short, um, I failed the course. And um, it's been a long, winding um, journey. I've struggled to come back to the top. I had to work at B&Q for a while. I struggled to make myself um, come back at the top. I'm st I still do feel um, the um, repercussions of what happened to me over 13 years ago, but... Um, yeah, it is what it is. And also, it took me five years to get a diagnosis. Whereas people were um, getting six months, one year to get a diagnosis, I, it took me five solid years. Mm -hmm. At first, I got told um, by a doctor or a GP mm -hmm. that autism is a childhood disease. Those are the exact words. Yes. of the medical professional. Autism is a childhood disease. They didn't even want to uh, make a referral. Once they made the referral, um, I think they sent me a letter, but sent it to a wrong address, so someone else received it, never got to me. They say, sorry, you've missed your appointment. Um, it wasn't until I was, um, I faced a different unrelated problem that I was completely suicidal. That, um, yeah, I went through CBT, and, and that's cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes. And my therapist, being so kind, um, referred me um, to the um, diagnostic center. And that started the process. And I had my diagnosis, full diagnosis of autism spectrum condition. Yeah. Wow. Thank, thank you so much. Yes, acceptance it, it's, seems, seems to be an issue at some point. And um, I do believe that acceptance is it, it, actually a new it is it's, it's going to show you the way mm -hmm. it's accepting your reality it's knowing that this is who i am this is where i am now and i am going to live my life from now onwards with whatever i am going through with whatever i have been diagnosed with and and i know acceptance as well is a process there are many out there who have blamed um uh, parents with autistic children for not being able to accept their children with, with autism or their children with a disability. Acceptance is a gradual process. It doesn't come on a single day. On a single day, it takes longer for others and it takes a shorter time for others depending on individuals, on how, on people's mindset, how they perceive things and, and how resilient they can be as well. Autism acceptance is a topic for another day, which we are still, which we are also going to talk about it. Yes, because it, it's, it's an issue. Like William said, um, people do not want him to accept the fact that he is autistic. Yes, in our black community, there are so many, this topic, autism, mental health, they don't want you to talk about it. We, people want you to, shh, to, to, to say it only um, under your roof, only inside your house, because it, it's regarded as personal issues. You are not supposed to talk about it in the open. But sometimes you need to talk about these issues in order to get help, in order to get healing. In, and using your own experiences, you talk about this to help others out there because people will listen to you. They will have, they'll, they'll be hopeful that there's a better future. And they will also know, know that because this person is there, I am not alone. So I'll come over to you, Marcus. What about you? What are some of the challenges you faced or you are currently facing in your community being, being a black autistic adult? Um, for number one in America, bl black autism really doesn't exist. There's a lot of African-American women as advocates 
for autism here in America. Mm-hmm. But the the male version of it, it does not exist like that. So to see uh, me as an autism activist in America, and I'm a black individual, it's mm-hmm. like where he come from, where he pop up at. Um, you know, um, for me, it's growing up it was the Caucasians. I didn't really have problems with the African American community. I had problems with the Caucasians because in America, if you yell longer than five minutes, that's a straight jacket. You're getting locked up. You're going to the mental institution. If you jump on your desk, if you get near your teacher's face, you're going to the mental institution. That's just what it is. Like that's, that's not a game. It's it's what it is. They're locking you up. Either they're putting you in juvenile or they're gonna put you in a mental institution. That are probably both. And for for me, um, you, you know, like when William was saying, you know. And that's why I'm glad we, this conversation is happening because, you know, he's expressed his story from his family, how they have a name and prestige and stuff of that nature. Marcus, on the other hand, my family have issues. You understand what I'm saying? So I come from poverty. We don't have a name. Yeah. I come from straight from the hood, you know, noodles and pork and beans. So, I mean, in I think in the retrospect, when my mother was raising so many children, so to deal with an individual, yeah. um, to deal with an individual is like with mental situations. I don't want to yeah. say a disability. When you're yeah. dealing with a person that has m- mental situations and you have other children, those other children comes before me. So when my ribs got broke by my father and I was bleeding on the living room floor, yeah. when my mom walked out with my father, you know what I'm saying? If it wasn't for my uncle, we wouldn't be having this conversation. I was four. Aww. You understand what I'm saying? So, like, yeah. I came from horrendous abuse. Horrendous abuse. Mm-hmm. Because I couldn't speak. I couldn't talk. I was using the bathroom on myself and everything else. I wasn't like the other kids. Mm-hmm. So he couldn't take me to the park and show me off and throw a football with me or throw a basketball with me. He couldn't do that because I was slobbing on myself. I was having issues. So his best recourse was was to break my ribs and constantly abuse me or send me to school with no shoes on or put me in a corner and let me hold brown encyclopedia books that I can't lift up. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> so my <laughs> my situation wasn't pretty. And every time I try to tell a teacher at school or I would act out, they would put me in a mental institution mm-hmm. because they would claim it was behavior issues. But I was just trying to write to them what's going on in my house. But, you know, when they don't want to listen to you because they feel like they're authoritative. They feel like they're on top so they can tell you what to do. You got to listen, what, 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 whatever, whatever. And then people cover it up with spirituality. Yeah. They say they say you got a demon in you. We just trying to get it out. So they beat the brakes off of you. Even when you having your mental situations, they beat the brakes off of you. And then they want to quote Bible scriptures. Why are they beating you? I mean, just that's just that's just their justification of it. I don't know about William, but nobody in my lifetime understood my mental complexities. Nobody, nobody softened it. Nobody supported it. Nobody did anything except my grandmother and my sisters, period. Period. So when my grandmother died, when she was when I was 24 and she was holding my hand and she said, don't let your disability make anybody's make room at anybody else's dinner table be the leader did i know you me and god know you are that changed my whole life wow i stopped looking at myself as a problem and looking at myself as a solution Mm -hmm. and that's when i decided to really get to the point of trying to become a voice not necessarily to tell people Oh, well, this is autism. This is what happens when you have autism. Whoop de whoop. Because you can go on any Google site, you can go to any MSN and get your proper research or whatever. My thing is to be able to tell you about my story and how God blessed me to be where I am today. Not that I'm my situation is better than yours because we both have the same trials and tribulations. Yeah. But if God can do it for me, then I know he can do it for you. Who am I? Like William said, he is autism. You can't separate William from autism. The same thing with Marcus. You cannot separate autism from Marcus. 
Mm -hmm. So the thing is, we have to be strong enough as men to be able to speak out and let, and if, if we can touch one person, yeah. then we've done our job. Brilliant. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. I'm so sorry. I don't know if I should say that for, for what happened to you, but I am so grateful for your grandma, for your sister and your uncle. Yes. I would like to meet them someday and really and give them a hug and say thank you. Unfortunately, not all families will embrace autism or their child's disability like some do. But we thank God for uh, the family members who eventually accept. And God, yes, God plays a huge part in, in everything that happens that 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 happens around us and we thank him we are always grateful for that i know at at some point you um especially when parents are struggling with autism acceptance um s some actually go into church they pray more yes prayers help but i will say that prayers help if you also try to look for ways to for ways to help. So while you are busy looking for interventions or for ways to support your child, add in those prayers because if you put in only prayers without doing anything else, it won't work. So God and action, they go together. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, um, Marcus, for for telling us your story. And then we we go we move on to the next question. Um. Okay, I think William has already said when he was diagnosed. I'm I'm sure you, I'm sure you did because my next question is what was when were you diagnosed with autism? Uh, do you just want to say something or are you okay with what you said? Uh, um, I, I'll just say I was diagnosed in April 2018. That's just two years ago. Mm, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. What about you, Marcus? I was when, diagnosed. When... I was diagnosed with autism April 12, 1993. Um, by Dr. King and Clifton Springs Mental Health Center in Decatur, Georgia. Um, mm -hmm. They called it severe, severe autism. They called it classic autism. Mm -hmm. He was Dr. King was scratching his head, got up from his desk, talking about, told my grandma, there's nothing that they can do. Yeah. Um, you know, he has classic autism. But mm -hmm. if he takes two to three of these Ritalin pills a day, yeah. Then we we can we can govern his behavior here at the hospital. Yeah. It's it's only a thousand milligrams. We can govern his behavior based mm -hmm. off the pills he takes. Now I was taking that Paxil, Lithium, Seroquel, Zoloft. Do I mean, <laughs> I mean, I was taking this stuff till I was twenty four. I'm thirty seven. Wow. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So that mm -hmm. was my life from six to twenty four. Medicine. Mm -hmm. And they just felt like that was their best course of recourse because I don't, again, I don't know about UK. I don't know um, y'all hospitals or whatever, but in America, if mm -hmm. they don't have the proper research or the proper information, they're going to go off their head. Yeah. They're not, they not, <laughs> they not going <laughs> to, they didn't have the, re the, the information of autism in 93. Yeah. There was no, nobody. It was just, listen, if your child was bad, give him a whooping, put him in church, or put him in some type of summer camp. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what it was. It was mm -hmm. not, no, like, like your child has severe autism. What is that? Mm -hmm. My grandmother hit, I don't, can't even imagine how many times my grandma hit the doctor with her purse. I can't even imagine how many times. <laughs> she kept telling him, nope, I'm not accepting that. And they was like, ma'am, you have to calm down. You have to listen to us. We the professionals. Your grandson is basically walking brain dead. He will never do anything normal individuals would do. Wow. This is really, really powerful. Uh, thank you once more, everyone, for, for watching and for tuning in. We really do appreciate your time and the efforts you've taken to, to join in. If you have any questions, feel free to put them here and ask Marcus or William. Yes, it's quite powerful and inspirational, as some do say. Yes, it takes really, it, it takes a lot to be able to, to share your experiences, especially with, with autism, which most often people think uh, autism is a childhood disease or autism is a medical uh, issue, forgetting about the social aspect of it. So, 
if you are watching, you share and still invite your friends to to join in. We move on. Um, how was it going to school? What 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 were some of the challenges? What was it from childhood? Did you find lots of difficulties? Given that you you were diagnosed at a later age, um, William, how how was your experience at school? Okay, um, when I was born, um, okay, before that, I have to establish this fact. I was born prematurely. Um, I think I was born around five or six months. It was really serious. Um, I was put in a, an incubator, and um, that was in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. It wasn't in Africa, yeah. At the time where I was born, if I had been born in Africa, I would have died because there wasn't the resources that support, yes, that infrastructure, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, my life went on quite normally. Um, I've been healthy throughout my life. I've never spent um, a day at the hospital um, apart from when I was born. And so I've not been admitted as a child or as, as an adult, just as a baby. Yeah. And um, yeah, so life was just okay for me until my first day at school, kindergarten. That's when my whole life turned upside down. That's when I realized that actually there's something very wrong either with the world or with me because there's something super ep um, uber epically wrong over here i mean <laughs> yeah. on the first day of school everybody made friends they were speaking to each other and i couldn't believe that these people were seeing themselves for the first day today because it's like they've always known each other but yeah. i couldn't fit in i couldn't blend i was on my own i didn't even know what i was doing there so for the whole term, I spent the whole year um, going around the school looking for my sister. My sister was in class two and I was in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Now, my sister also believes she's on the spectrum, but girls present better than boys. They're able to mimic the um, behavior, the social behavior of their peers. So she blended in, she fitted in, she made lots of friends. She was a very popular girl. She was doing very well in her class. But I, on the other hand, was underachieving. I repeated kindergarten. I mean, repeating kindergarten. Can you imagine that? About three <laughs> or four times, every time they would put liners up in front of the school at assembly and all the, um, teachers from the next class will call their um, students, their new students, and they'll be in the same line. And they'll start to call people from um, preschool or nursery to come and join the line where I was. I was the tallest in my class, yet I didn't have a clue. And also, um, they used to change me all the time. By changing me, I mean um, personal care hygiene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, changing my, um, I wasn't in nappies, I was in pants, but they were always changing me. There was a woman who was supposed to change me. She was like a cleaner over there and she used to insult me. I, I need to um, put this out there. If your child doesn't speak or he stinks a lot, he flaps a lot, he turns around a lot and that kind of thing. He doesn't make any eye contact. He's always humming. Do not believe for one second that he's not aware of his or her environment because they know. I'm 42 right now. I'll be 43 on my next birthday. And I still remember the insults I received when I was four in wow. kindergarten. There was this woman called um, Auntie Mary of blessed memory. She passed away right now. She was oh. a very old woman. She used to insult me, insult <laughs> my mother, insult my generations just because she always had to change me. I mean, everybody was toilet trained. I was toilet trained, but my belief was that I will go to the loo whenever I get home. I didn't want to use the, uh, the loo in the school where everybody uses, yeah. So people thought that I was incontinent. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't speak, I wouldn't explain. I was always doing that. And also during my break times, I'll be walking around, picking objects from the floor, whilst other people will be playing. So I became the laughter, the, st the laughing stock of um, the school. My mother heard of it, and um, my family heard of it. Every time visitors come to um, home, they'll be talking about my behavior, hoping that I'll snap out of it. I never did. Then um, my mother who was working at um, as a diplomat by then, was posted to France and we went there. That was a pivotal point in my life because yeah. Once we got to France, there was more acceptance. People were more open-minded. I was able to make friends for the first time in my life. I got people who were interested in the things that I like. We liked animals. I like cartoons. So um, 
I got to blend in with a small group of friends, many of whom I'm still in touch with right now. Wow. And we went back to Ghana. When I went back to Ghana, I realized that all the bullying I had um, experienced before came uh, returned back into my life. People were calling me names. I didn't have many friends. and um, But I realized that unlike when I was a kid, where I was um, underachieving, I was overachieving right now. Apart from math, where I was struggling a lot, all the other subjects, I was um, quite brilliant at them. And I made a few friends, but they were no real friends. They only wanted me to teach them French or to do their art homework for them. Whenever it was finished, that was it. Um, I never got into a relationship at school, not, not because I didn't want it, but because nobody wanted me. Um, yeah, it was quite a struggle. Um, I did um, achieve quite a lot. I earned a lot of prizes through secondary school. It was when I got to university that I realized that it was a bit hard. I was struggling because online school where everything had to be relied on my memory, my ability to memorize facts. I've got a very bad short-term memory, but an excellent long-term memory. Okay. At university, it's not just about your memory, remembering facts, but it's about putting them to use, synthesizing, extrapolating, other things like that. And I couldn't really do all that. Yeah. So um, it dragged me a bit down. So that is in a nutshell um, what I experienced through school. Okay, that's quite interesting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's quite interesting. Thanks for sharing that. What about you, um, Marcus? What, what um, experiences? I, yeah. I, I think school for me was, um, it was just a complete escape because I never wanted to go home. I wanted mm -hmm. to stay in school. Um, the eight, seven, eight hours or whatever. I was always in special education. Mm -hmm. um, it was always four to five people in my classroom. Yeah. Um, I, I I think I ever started getting IEPs at kindergarten, and um, like William, I'm not scared to say, it. yeah, I had to skip. I had to do kindergarten like two, three times, two, one, two, three, one. You know what I'm saying? I had to do kindergarten two, yeah. three times, stuff like that, because it was hard for me to focus not only on my schoolwork because I didn't understand it. The books looked gibberish. The words, mm -hmm. I couldn't understand anything. And then when they did the hands-on stuff, I really couldn't understand it. So yeah. it, it it was it became more of, I didn't want to go home because I my, my biological. So, so it was, it was like school was my escape. I was, I was there. I didn't really have friends. I didn't have friends. Um, I think I got my first girlfriend when I was in like six, seven grade. She was my bully. She was a little person. And um, yeah, that's just what it was. She was a little person. So, um, and she took my $20 for a strawberry shortcake that my aunt gave me and she gave it back and stuff like that. And then she just told me I was gonna be her boyfriend. So I didn't, you know, she was the bully of the school. So what I was gonna say. No, I'm but <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but but um, school became more of a of a really it became more of a, an escape. My sisters used to help do my work, mm -hmm. so they used to do my work, take my hand, write my name on the paper after they did my work, and make me turn it in. So oh, wow. that became com my com my my comfort zone. Because instead of them helping me, that became them enabling me. Mm -hmm. um, because they knew my circumstance. So I took it like, okay, y'all doing my homework. Here's chapter four, chapter mm -hmm. three. Um, <laughs> my teacher said I need to draw this son. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, we're doing it. Let's, let's go all the way. But um, I, I think... I think school for me again was a, was an escape because my home life was so tremendous. So, okay. so so I mean you know I think that I always blame myself because I didn't give my father what he wanted. Even though he had other sons, he constantly kept saying that I was a uh, disrespect to him. He stopped going to church because he said, "Why would God give him a child that has mental issues?" No lie, he stopped going to church. So when you hear this amongst the room conversations with your mom, you hear this. He's yelling this stuff out. You in the living room, you hear it. Those walls ain't that thick. 
So it's like I felt so bad. Like I was the reason he didn't want to give he didn't want to go give God his all because he mm -hmm. felt like he had a son that has those type of situations. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much for, for sharing. And everyone watching, if you are autistic or if you have any condition uh, that is affecting you, know this now. It is not your fault. You didn't ask to be born that way. You did not request to be born into a certain family. And so never blame yourself. And same goes to the parents. Do not blame yourself for having an autistic child or for having a child with any form of disability. God has his reasons for doing whatever thing he does. And when that happens, he helps us handle the situation. So we put everything in his hands. And so to you, Marcus, today, do not blame yourself anymore. If your your dad didn't go, stopped going to church, that was his own decision. I hope at some point he will realize and he will go back. We pray for that. Um, and thank you once more, everyone, for, for watching. So we are on the Voice of Hope Media. And our edition is Let's Give the Voice. And today we are giving a voice to being autistic being black and in the black communities. Yes, we've listened to some very challenging, some emotional uh, stories right here today. But overall, what we have today is education. We have empowerment, we have inspiration, we have hope. To anyone out there who has an autistic child, you listen to these two guys today, turn around, look at your child and you know that, tell him, that there is hope. I know you will be able to do more than you are capable of doing now. To you, that parent who, who out there, who sits there and you think that that's all about you, look at me today. I am sitting here. I'm the mom of, of, of a 15-year-old autistic boy, and I know there is hope. So do not lose it. There is hope. If not now, if not tomorrow, in the future, someday, it will happen. Never give up. We continue with our show. We've, we've been on here for about one hour, nine minutes, and we still have a few more minutes to go. I hope you guys are still okay with time. Are you okay, Marcus? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. I'm good. I'm good. Great. And thank you so much for your patience. So I actually want, um, I actually wanted to, to, to ask my next question was, did you or do you find it uh, easy having um, a relationship being, being autistic? Um, I know William touched. Was it difficult? Um, I know you are married. Was it was it difficult? <laughs> do you want me to ask that question? If you feel comfortable. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one thing uh, about me is that as an autistic advocate, I just put everything out there. Um, okay. I don't hide anything because it might help someone who is in my situation. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't difficult. It was impossible. That's mm -hmm. how I put it here. Mm -hmm. It's um, it was um, it's just by a miracle that um, I managed to get married because, as I said, no one wanted me. Um, I'm now 42, I'll be 43 next um, year. And I think I can confidently say I am the only 43-year-old man who doesn't have an ex-girlfriend. Not because um, not because I'm so um, good and I'm so holy that I just grabbed the uh, first girl that I loved or ended. No, it's not. Nobody wanted me. Only one person accepted me. That's <laughs> he <just> it. Grabbed. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. It was. Um, it was just a life of um, rejections. Um, like um, my female friends were um, okay with being my friend and everything, but whenever I expressed any interest taking things further, it was like, how dare you? I mean, just look at you. They wouldn't say it that way, but um, that was what it's, it, it was what it was. And they'd rather go for um, that guy who who is mean, to me at least, <laughs> uh, who is a bully, 
um, even look at the shape of his head. I mean, there's nothing in it. Of course, he plays football and he's got muscles, but what, what good is it to you? Um, I'm a kind person. I'm talented. I'm I'm gentle, yet um, I don't go anywhere. I mean, I'm I'm not worthy of anything. I just do not understand. Um, mm. But yeah, so I didn't get my first girlfriend until I was 25, and I married her when I was um, 27. Oh wow! Yeah, um, mm -hmm. we've struggled through um, these years. I've got uh, three daughters, um, and um, yeah, it's it's been quite a bit of a struggle because I'm not the um, normal um, or neurotypical um, husband who would. Um, blending with your friends and your family and that sort of thing. Yeah, I try my best. I try to smile. And um, I'm not uh, the confrontational type. If something hurts me, I wouldn't tell you straight in your face. I'll just keep quiet and drink water on top. That sort of thing. I'm, yeah. But, um, yeah, I'll say it's, it's, it's not been easy getting into a relationship or being into a relationship. I'm someone who finds it very easy, very hard to make friends and very easy to lose friends yeah yeah mm -hmm. mm. yeah ah, great job um well done to to the queen <laughs> that's the wife that, that she's the one Thank i call you. she's the I'll first you know. mm -hmm. she's the first lady and she'll always be the first lady and marcus mm -hmm. i know you are a dad yes ma'am right. first, Tell first us. of all congratulations to william and his successful marriage Thank um, you. I done been married three times, okay? I done tried it three times. I did. It's like me keep milking the same cow. I did. I tried it. Lord knows. <laughs> I mean, me and relate me and relationships, we just don't mix. And then okay. just like just like William said, when you tell a woman that you have autism, mm -hmm. like I be trying to go on these dating sites and everything else. Soon as the soon as you say word for word, yes, I was born with autism. Mm -hmm. Like I you don't understand how many times I've seen Casper. That's a new saying in America. They done ghosted oh. me. Like, like as soon as I say it, it's like their their profile get blocked. <laughs> <laughs> like, like at first I was seeing pictures, then then the next thing I know, I ain't seeing none. It says this person is no longer on this. Like, like, <laughs> like <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> I never. I ain't never had a long lasting relationship. The longest, longest relationship I ever been in was almost seven years. That was with my third wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm almost 37, so that sounds bad. You know what I'm saying? Like I've been married three times. Will I get married for the fourth time? God gotta do it. That's all I gotta say. God gotta do it. I mean, <laughs> God can do all things. You know what I'm saying? So like <laughs> God gotta do it. Cause you don't put yourself and all, and then with these wives, when you have an emotional behaviors, when you have difficulties, I done had two of my ex-wives leave me because of an emotional behavior. They didn't want to deal with it. It was too much for them to deal with the the, the reactions of autism. Yeah. And and then, you know, my third wife, God bless her soul. She just, yeah. <laughs> again, all I'm gonna say is God bless her soul. <laughs> We're going to leave it there. We have a son. His name is Malachi. And I have a nine-year-old daughter named Skylar from way back in the day. Way, way back. <laughs> back there. Back there. Back in the day. Um, uh -huh. um, I, I, I mean, again, um, being a father is, is um, the greatest gift God can ever give an individual. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not easy um, with my situation. But I thank God for my situation, and I thank God for my kids. Mm -hmm. So that's just where I'm at. Wow. Thank you so much. And con congratulations for your new baby. Uh, how old is Malachi? Oh, is Malachi it? ain't new. That's not a new baby. He's four years old, going on 40. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's not. That's not four years good. going on 40. That's good. <laughs> yeah, he's going on 40. He's going on 40. He's going to be all right. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. Let's move on to our next question. So what, what tips what um, tips would you give to parents of, of autistic individuals whose children are still, 
whose children are not yet adults, that I, I am one of them. So what advice would you give me? William. Oh, um, first of all, um, believe in them. Mm -hmm. Yes, because they might sound like they might not be self-aware, but they are aware of everything. They hear you and everything that you tell them become part of their internal working model. By internal working model, I mean, um, it's... Um, what you tell them is going to be like their inner voice. Yes. It's going to be the basis of their self-confidence in future. So if you tell them things like, um, why did God give me a child like you? Or you don't even need to tell them, but they, they can easily hear you say things like that. Yeah. They, um, they might, uh, it might affect their self-confidence and they need their confidence because um, being born different in this world it's like an upstream battle mm -hmm. on the path to, to their own success. Yeah. And um, if they don't have that ground and that basis, that foundation of confidence, it's going to affect that um, battle. They need to have someone who believes in them. them. Okay. And also, secondly, the fact that a child might be nonverbal doesn't mean they do not communicate. Doesn't mean they don't have a language because um, language or communication is not just verbal. Yeah. It can be written, they can type it, they can um, sign, they can use um, PECS, um, that's mm -hmm. picture exchange um, communication system. Um, yes, when used in a um, proper way that um, respects them, not in the ABA way, which they are forced to um, communicate here yeah. yeah. and also listen to um, autistic adults because autistic adults have been autistic kids before and they yeah. know what it feels to be a, an autistic child mm -hmm. um, even though um, one autistic person might be different from the other we mm -hmm. all have a common ground so yeah. maybe something that someone would say might mm -hmm. uh, be helpful to you mm -hmm. um, also take a break sometimes um, okay. Yeah, enjoy your life. I know it can be stressful for you to be um, looking after your child 24-7, but mm -hmm. just take a break, be yourself, um, I don't know, just um, relax. That's what I would say. Thank yeah. you so much for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. I really appreciate. Listen to autistic adults. Yes, because they've been they've been autistic children before. That's very, very important. And also, parents, remember to take a break. Yes, the best gift a parent can give their child is their own happiness. And if you don't take care of yourself, it's going to take away your happiness. And when you are not happy, it affects your children. It affects the rest of the family. And what about you, Marcos? What, what advice would you give parents? Um, yeah, I would definitely say, you know, patience. You have to put God first in all your situations and dealings. Um, and 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 decisions when it comes to your child, yes. um, you have to, you, like William said, take a break. Um, you and you have to stop labeling them. Number one, if the doctor label them, don't mean you need to label them, yes. because what the doctor sees you may not see because you had them. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you have to know the kings and queens that you're help to raising. God put them in your life for a reason. So he already knows what they're going to become. So you yeah. can't get frustrated through the process of seeing what they're going to become. There's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with them having autism or any other situations. The thing mm -hmm. is, is what we do as parents is we get frustrated quick. We want to mm -hmm. throw in a towel quick because we're not seeing an instant solution. This is not a microwave. It's not a hungry man. So it's the process that we have to go through. So even in that process, if you have some friends you can talk to, a uh, support group, um, if you have a pastor, if you have a family member, anybody that you can lean on and cry on their shoulders, don't be too ashamed to do it. Because there's many nights that as autism adults, we don't cry on somebody's shoulders. We didn't have to lean on somebody's shoulders. Because like William said, we was, we was autism kids before we became autism adults. Mm -hmm. Understand that you have to structuralize a family plan. So if you don't have a family plan structuralized, 
structure as a family plan. That way that you won't be feeling like you're doing all the work. You might have somebody else to tag in. This is a team situation. You cannot do this by yourself. This is a team situation. So we have to come together as family, friends, acquaintances, whatever title you want to put it, because it takes a village to raise a child. So it takes a village to give this child knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that he or she deserves. Yeah. Wow. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Patience, God. Stop labeling your children. Yes. Thank you so much for that. And if you find yourself in, in a completely new environment, in a new community with, with new friends, with new people, how do you integrate? Um, it's quite difficult. Um, is it as a oh, an that, that's, yes, and as an as an autistic adult, how mm -hmm. how do you integrate, or how do you, um, or what would you expect from them? And given that sometimes you you may not recognize people, even people you've known before, talk less of those you've never met before. So how, how, mm -hmm. how do you integrate? How do you make yourself um, understood in that new environment? I think that's a better way of putting it. Okay, oh, that's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. Because personally, I find it quite hard to integrate in new environments. And uh, mm -hmm. what I might do is that I might put up um, a front, a confident front, try to appear friendly, try to mimic the friendliness of other people hoping that it works. Most of the time it doesn't work because yeah. there's something that bonds people together that I don't have. I don't know whether it's a particular smell. I don't know a pheromone. I don't know what it is, but um, people gel in ways that um, doesn't, I don't seem to understand. Um, but when I have a friend who is supportive, it's easier for me to make friends with their friends okay. and to blend in that community mm -hmm. yeah okay so what that's my strategy yeah what well, my grandma you? my grandma when i was like 13 of 13 14 or whatever she put a sticker on me that was okay. my first day of school she put a sticker with my name this those big old blue and white stickers she put a mm -hmm. sticker with my name and under it it says marcus has autism so she okay. says, anytime you're around a new environment or a new group or whatever, she told me to shake their hand and tell them, hi, my name is Marcus Boyd. I have autism. Okay. And then she's, I mean, some, okay. So half of the people thought I was crazy. A lot of people didn't want to eat lunch with me because of that. But, <laughs> but um, it, it did help me get some friends. It did help me get. Um, some people that really want to learn more, not so of a disability point, not like, oh, he has this. They just wanted to learn more so they can get better understanding. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people was wanting me to come home with them and introduce me to their parents like I was a show and tell project. I mean, <laughs> you know, I got used to it after a while because they, they was offering food. So I did, get, I did get used to it after a while. But mm -hmm. I mean, they was like, mom, mom, he has autism. And then, you know, some parents was like, don't you say that about him? Welcome, you know, introduce him in or whatever. Like they were saying, I have AIDS. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, miseducation leads to ignorance. Yeah. Wow. That's really brilliant. And uh, I, I actually read um, from one one. He's an autistic white ad adult as well. He, he actually said um, that sometimes when he looks around, he doesn't really uh, uh, have a he, he, he doesn't think there are enough resources to support autistic adults. And also a few days ago, I don't know if the person is actually watching this show now. So someone sent me a message on this page and she said, that her, her son is 42 and he's quite isolated. He doesn't have friends and he's looking for individuals to, to speak to. So I actually gave her the, the link to this page and I said, there's a show to, today and there are autistic adults on the show where he can watch and connect with you guys. So what, what do you think are, are some of the resources that, that you as adults would need to support you being autistic? Uh, Marcus, 
Um, I would think that it needs to be more people that's willing to step out and do some type of big brother, big sister programs for adults who have autism. See, okay. we had that growing up as children. I had a behavior aid and everything else. But mm -hmm. adults, when they shun you off at 17, 18 or whatever, whatever, they don't give you that same support. Yeah. We need that same support as adults with autism. We need, uh, you know, friend networking groups or mm -hmm. Zoom meetings or, you know, because just for the, the, for the lady that has a son that's 42, mm -hmm. anybody can reach out to Marcus. I don't care mm -hmm. if you have autism or don't have autism. Mm -hmm. We want to have a friendly conversation. Let's get to know each other. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what age you are. Yeah. Um, because everybody needs somebody that they can really lean on. And so I understand that it needs to be more resources as far as books, pamphlets. It needs to be more activities that we can get together in networking events and to be able mm -hmm. to meet each other, to be able to mm -hmm. understand each other. Because we understand each other because we all have uh, autism as adults. Mm -hmm. So we just, some of us just stop need to be afraid and ashamed and yep. let's just, let's just get out there and hold our hands as one. Cause that's what we are. We won. Okay. That's brilliant. Yeah. I think that if even having, having um, talk shows like this and including autistic uh, uh, individuals, I, I think it's, it's absolutely necessary or, or even parents of autistic children can actually come on the show with their own children. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Even if your child cannot talk, they can communicate. From what William said, communication is not just talking. Communication is just not about the spoken language. Remember that every behavior is a communication. Even your child crying, he or she is saying something. Your child they're throwing tantrums or meltdowns, that is a communication, which we need to understand, to know why that is that is actually happening. And William, what about you? Um, what are some of the resources that will be needed to, to support autistic adults? Okay, like, um, like Marcus said, yeah, we need um, resources, we need um, networking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I belong to an organization called um, Autistic Inclusive Meets. Mm -hmm. um, and we do organize um, activities for autistic people and their families. Mm -hmm. um, we've got quite a few um, black and minority ethnic um, people amongst us mm -hmm. and um, yeah we organize um, lots of um, activities, outings um, picnics cinema trips and other um, and things like that, football matches yeah. Um, yes and we connected to uh, many uh, different organizations like uh, McDonald's so sometimes they um, even give, give us um, some free tickets or some meals and other mm. things like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, other resource um, I would like to speak about is what we call Brain in Hand. When I was um, studying at university mm. recently for my master's degree, um, I was given this um, app called Brain in Hand by the Student Finance um, Disability um, Wing. I don't know whether you can, I don't think you can really see it, no, but yeah. um, it's a, an app that helps you to um, log in how you're feeling, what you're finding difficult. If you find something difficult, there's a red traffic light um, to press mm -hmm. if you are in distress, uh, an orange traffic light if you are finding it difficult by your coping, and a green mm -hmm. traffic light if everything is okay. Now, if you press the um, orange three times in a row, or if you press the red one, you receive a call from a respondent to make sure mm -hmm. whether you are okay or not. Also, yes. it's got a timetable and a diary uh, to remind you of um, things you have to do. For example, if you have to study at uh, five o'clock, for example, or, or you go to class, it will remind you so that you know what to expect because autistic people rely a lot on sameness, a routine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if there's, for example, a disruption to your routine, you lock it in um, so that you know exactly what to do. For example, if I'm supposed to take the bus at four o'clock, yeah. I have previously logged in that if the four o'clock bus is late for one reason or the other, what do I do? Yeah. So when the bus is late, I'll just look on my um, app and to tell me what to do, take another bus or call the workplace and say that you'll be late or something like that. So it's something like um, a support for your brain system. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow, so that's it's brilliant. Called, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's called Brain in Hand. Okay, so I I will I will really I'd, I'll very much appreciate if at at the end of the the show or even now if it's possible you just type in the the link in the in the comment section because that seems it seems quite helpful and it okay. may help other people out there. Yeah, I just want to use this moment to appreciate everyone watching. I am so grateful for your time. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. So I, I really appreciate your time today, your comments, your shares. If there are any questions, I know Marcus or William, they'll be able to answer them after after the show. Yeah, one of the comments that really stands out is um, someone says it takes a village to raise a child. Yes. And it takes a child with autism to raise the consciousness of that village. As we are rounding up, we get to the end of our show. Any final words from anyone? Any final words, uh, Marcus, to anyone out there who is struggling with understanding or accepting an autistic individual? What would you tell them? Just use this as your final word to the end of the show. Okay, so to everybody out there in America, um, if you are struggling to understand anything about a person with autism, Mm -hmm. um, I will say this, um, you have to do your research, you have to do your research on the computer, and you need to do your research in your heart. You need to start with your heart first, because mm -hmm. God has to reposition a new patience, a new understanding, a new compassion, a new mm -hmm. passion in your heart and your spirit to be mm -hmm. able to understand this person that has autism. Yeah, there's not that person's fault. There's not a disability. There's nothing wrong with that person. That mm -hmm. person could be just the president as Donald Trump is the president. OK, maybe not Donald Trump, but I mean, as a president, um, yeah. as, a, as a president, yeah. um, that person can be a lawyer, a doctor. Mm -hmm. That person can be a judge. Anything that person can be with autism, you mm -hmm. cannot use their their discapability as their inability. Mm -hmm. Because you don't you don't know what their ability going to be because you haven't allowed them to grow up yet. And you haven't yeah. or you don't know what God put you with. God put you with this special individual for a reason. Yeah. So you have to be able to allow God's work to get finished before you try to play God. True. We can't play God with our own children because God put us with our children for a special reason. Mm -hmm. We just have to be the individuals to help guide and nurture what God has put up, what God has put before us. Amen. We ask for blessings and we ask for miracles, but when, when that miracle don't come out or don't look a certain way or don't act a certain way, we have a problem with the miracle that God has blessed us with. Yeah. So, so that means that your faith is dead. Because how can you say you have faith in God, but you're not appreciating the miracle that he put in your face? Wow. So that's what I would say. I will say I do have a documentary coming out next Wednesday. It's called My First Word is Music um, to talk about my uh, little bit of my experience of autism. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's huge here in America because, again, there's never there hasn't been in over 20 years an African-American male to come out to say that he has autism and it has a documentary and stuff of that nature. So and I do appreciate me being on your platform. I definitely appreciate my, you know, my PR, Vanessa Bob, second, yes. a second, you know, what I'm saying a second, a second voice and everything that she does out there in the UK. Rafia, the film director, my team, you know, what I'm saying in America, mm -hmm. because. It takes a village to help support this adult autistic act, advocates. Yeah. It, it takes a village to help support me. And I appreciate me being on your platform. I love your platform. I'm a huge fan out here in America yeah. of all your topics, of all your shows and stuff of that nature. Mm -hmm. You continue to be the advocate and the voice and the light for your son. Because it's, it's through you. It's through you that your son is going to be able to prevail and conquer and, 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 and conquer anything in life. Mm -hmm. Because it, if God gives you autism, God gives you a mouth to speak with autism. It's just the parents don't realize that they're the advocate. The parents keep trying to be the solution and the resolver instead of being the advocate and the light. Yeah. Whoa. Wow. This is brilliant. This is so, so huge. If God gives you autism, God gives you a mouth to speak. 
about autism. He gives you the voice. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really, really appreciate these words to today, um, Marcus. And I, yes, I really appreciate the fact that you, you approached me to be on the show. I'm really grateful. And yes, you will still be you will still come back to the show in, in a few months to come. We are going to talk about that. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And William, over to you. Okay, um, my final word to anyone um, out there who is still struggling with understanding and accepting autism or accepting that they are autistic themselves, um, I would like to direct you to um, a few resources. The first one is My Autistic Sparkle. It's an eight-year-old girl on YouTube. Yeah, um, yeah an eight-year-old black girl who speaks about what it is to be autism, especially the positives of being an autism. It's worth um, looking for it, for her. Wow. Yes. And um, we've also got Green Streak. She's a young black adult as well who speaks about autism. Mm -hmm. We've got um, Lama Hardwick, who is an autism um, advocate and a pastor in the mm -hmm. USA as well. And we've got um, Emma Dalmain, who is... Um, my CEO, the CEO of my organization here. Yeah. Okay. She's written a book called, um, It's an Autism Thing, I'll Help You Understand. Another book called Susie Spins, mm -hmm. and quite a vocal um, activist. Okay. And yeah, so don't just see the negatives, but also see the positives of autism. Read and educate yourselves, as mm -hmm. um, Marcus said. Um, don't be quick to judge, be supportive, listen to autistic adults because they know firsthand what it means to be autistic, how it feels and what support might be required. And when you yeah. picture autism like a race or an ethnicity, um, the, a difference in um, neurology or a neurotype rather than an illness, that's where we begin to make progress and meeting in the middle. Um, don't be quick to judge by the behaviors or the attitude. Sometimes I might look like I'm angry, but it, I'm not angry at all. I'm just I'm tired. Yeah. So um, you just need to look at autism with an um, open mind. Yeah. And I also want to thank you very much for this great job you're doing. Thank you for inviting me on the show. And um, thank you, Marcos. Um, you, it's been very enlightening. Listen to your stories, listen to your encouragement and everything. Yeah. I hope we'll be able to um, connect and exchange um, address uh, other things like that. Um, thank you, um, Clarice, for all that you're doing. It's, it's quite amazing for being a voice on the black community. I believe that you go really, really far in um, breaking the barriers and the stigma around autism. Exactly, it will. Thank you so much, everyone. I just want to thank you, you two more especially, and a big shout out to Vanessa Bob, yeah, our, <laughs> our lady here here in in the UK. I haven't met. Um, is it Emma Dell or what? What's your Emma Dalmain. Emma Dal uh -huh. I haven't met her, but a big shout out to to her as well. I will definitely connect with with, with her as well. And hopefully, uh, William, I will be having you guys back on the show in. I, I, I have a project uh, coming on co coming on very soon, which was sponsored by Tesco's Bag of Life. So we are going to discuss it uh, after this show, but or oh, in the next coming in the next coming weeks. And I would like you guys to be back on the show. But I, from the bottom of my heart, I really thank you guys. It's been a learning a learning process. It's been a show of one hour, fourteen minutes, eighteen seconds of learning. No, I, I really, I really thank you. I um, yeah. your foundation, anything that we can do um, to help your foundation here in America, we yeah. all, we all for it. We all with it and stuff of that nature. Because again, your platform helped not only my story or my testimony um, mm -hmm. to be able to be heard by viewers and people in London. That's huge out here in America because we don't, we don't get to those other countries and stuff of that nature. So, you know, again, I'm very humbled and very honored. And, you know, this won't be a one-time situation. Yes, it won't be. And you guys have given a lot of hope to parents out there. And I'll, I promise you every feedback that I get after this show, I will share it with you guys. You've given a lot of hope to parents who thought that was the end of their journey with their child with autism. Thank you so much. Then there's one question which I'd, I would like to answer. It: How can parents be encouraged to participate in talk shows? 
such as this. All you need they, to do is to I'm, get in touch. Yeah, just get involved. You got to put your pride aside and be able to understand your truth and your and authenticity and your transparency when you're talking about your child, your adult child, or your teenager child and stuff of that nature. And you have to be able to understand too, which I'm going to say and I'm going to be done, that mm -hmm. autism lives matter. So we have to stand up and teach the police to stop bully, bullying and terrorizing our young teenagers with autism and our adults with autism. They have to be trained in the proper ways of how to deal with these individuals that have autism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think here, here in the UK, there is more being done now with the police, and they um, there's there's the the autism ambassadors, and they've or they, they, there are also police officers who are autism ambassadors as well. So a lot is a lot is actually being done at the moment. So parents, if you wish to get to come on the show to talk about your experiences, just get in touch, get involved. There's no need to be ashamed. You you can't be ashamed, and then you die in silence. Or because once you don't talk about it, your child struggles and you struggle as well. I actually said to someone this morning that in order to get healing for whatever thing you are struggling with, you have to first of all be true to yourself, because you cannot be going out there to seek for help, to seek for healing, and then you are still hiding your identity. You need to be true to yourself. You need to be open. In order to gain some form of transformation in your life, you have to go through that process where you will feel very, very uncomfortable. Not everyone will agree with you, but you will be placed in a position of a position where you'll be very uncomfortable in your situation before you become comfortable. So we are ending this show right now. And it's amazing how, how many people have watched today. I'm really, really grateful. And you stay tuned. Enjoy your weekend. And we'll see you again next Saturday with another topic. But in December, from December to January, we are going to talk more about autism, autism, life in lockdown, autism as a Black um, adult, as a Black child, autism in our community that is going to be our topic the whole of december january and the rest of next year so you guys stay blessed stay tuned and continue to be safe here in the uk we are in lockdown but we've been there before and we made it so in four weeks we are still going to make it in good health and both physical and mental health as well. So have a good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for watching. It's been AC Clarice Anger for your host at the Voice of Hope Media with Let's Give It a Voice. And we give a voice to autism in the Black community. Bye-bye.